Other announcements that we have next Tuesday, there are two things going on. AccuWeather is visiting the geography building. We're not sure what room yet, um, but it'll be at 12.30. And then later that night at 7 p.m., there's spotter training at uh, 120 West Do Doherty Street. So you have to call uh, to reserve a spot, so make sure you do that. You can find that stuff on Facebook. So. And if you want to be an officer, send us a letter before April 1st to our UGA AMS email account. So I think that's it. So I'll turn it over now. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for uh, heading out tonight uh, and joining us. Um, there's still plenty of food on this table, so don't feel like you're being rude. Go help yourself. There's plenty of chicken and dip and stuff, so please help yourself. Um, and uh, also, if you have any other questions regarding like officers and what the rules are, ask any of the officers, and we're going to be more than welcome to actually help you out and let you know um, exactly what, what that details. So, I'm going to go ahead and do a little introduction about James Spann. Uh, James Spann. So, James Spann was born in Huntsville, Alabama, but he grew up mainly in southern Alabama in a town named uh, Greenville, which is located between Montgomery and Mobile, Alabama. But by fifth grade, he moved to Tuscaloosa. And while in high school, he was very involved in radio, and he became a disc jockey at WTBCAM. And James earned his first ham radio license at the early age of 14 and holds an extra class license. James is still active in the radio business as he reports the weather for several dozen stations all across the country. He, uh, events such as the super outbreak of April 3rd, 4th, 1974 is one of the many events that sparked the interest in pursuing the meteorological field. Spann attended the University of Alabama where he earned a degree in electrical engineering. And after school, James landed his first television weather job in 1978 at WCFT in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. He went on to do weather various markets, including Montgomery, several times in Birmingham, and in, including Dallas. Spann enrolled and completed the broadcast meteor, uh, meteorology program at Mississippi State, where he earned the NWA and AMS seals of approval. And in 2005, uh, 2005 Spann upgraded the AMS seal of approval to the new certified broadcast meteorologist designation. 
<coughs> on top of that, James received an Emmy for live coverage of the deadly tornado which hit Tuscaloosa on December 16, 2000, which you'll see in a video shortly. And his work during this storm also helped ABC 3340 earn a prestigious award, the Edward R. Murrow Award for Spot News Coverage. James' coverage on television won him numerous awards. In 2013, he was elected to the National Academy of Television Arts and Science and Silver Circle, which represents his outstanding achievement that spans at least 25 years in the broadcast industry, with a proven uh, record of mentoring and community involvement. In his spectacular coverage of the April 27, 2011 event, um, that saved many, many lives because of his work. Um, Outbreak won him two national awards with the NWA, the National Weather Association, where he won the Broadcaster of the Year Award, and the AMS Award for Broadcast Meteorology. James received an honorary doctorate from the University of West Alabama in 2013. And the readers of the Birmingham Magazine voted James as the best TV personality in 2011 and the best tweeter in 2012. And he has been named the best weather anchor in the Alabama by the Associated Press and winner of the Alabama Broadcaster Association Abbey Award for Best Weathercaster in Alabama multiple times over his long career. So the important thing to grasp is that James Spann is great at what he does. If he tells people it could snow, they run and grab the necessary ingredients to make that special French toast. But you know, I have no idea where they get that idea of pursuing the milk <laughs> and the bread. You know, James... Yeah, this is going down to two. <laughs> you know, he's doing so well, now it's just like falling apart. <laughs> James, James is there for everyone. He, even for the snowmen outside, or, you know, or the owls, you know. Give, give the guy a hat. <laughs> it's called Google. Um, he constantly goes from school to school talking about the weather. He makes a big difference. And I have no idea how he does everything. And, and I also have no idea how this baker created this masterpiece, but it just shows you how much, how much he means to the community because he really does make a big difference. People want to be him. <laughs> and when severe weather strikes, when, 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 you know, when he's even off from work, he finds a way to get to the station, even if it means if he's on a summer vacation or just strolling through the park. That's a good look right there. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, this wasn't on air, it was streaming on, on, online. Not only does he do all this great stuff in weather, he's also huge with the community. He, he's currently the chairman of the board of Trinity Medical Center in Birmingham, Alabama, and he's done that for eight years. He's also an assistant coach on a summer high school baseball team. And finally, he's also on the Board of Visitors of the University of Alabama School of Communication and Information Science. Not only does he do that, he also hosts a weekly podcast all about the weather <coughs> called Weather Brains. And he has over 127,000 followers on Twitter alone and who knows how many likes on Facebook. James Spann can do it all. He has a passion for the weather, for social media, for communicating, for sports. And, <laughs> and, for me, and for music. This is, dead. this is clearly going down to two now. With that said, James Spann is the man. And uh, with further ado, I'm going to show you some, uh, some coverage from his career from the 70s, then go into the Superstorm in the early 90s, and then his other tornado coverage in the early 2000s and up to 20. I was 16 years old. Yeah, I don't have audio. See, this wasn't meant to be heard by <laughs> How? Yeah. 
Here, we'll, 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 we'll do this. And then we'll, we'll do, I think this will work. And obviously, this wouldn't have any audio. That's because nobody should be hearing this. <laughs> Well, I'm breathing a sigh of relief. <laughs> Anyways, so in, in this video, <laughs> I'll, I'll narrate it for you. No, this is good. This is good stuff. This was, I think, you, how old were you in that video? Sixteen. Sixteen years old, and it's showing. Uh, he was just talking, and, and, and you know, when I saw it, I was like, "That's not James Spann," because he had a very, he had a very thick Southern accent. Very. I just, I just yeah, I mean, it, it was great. And uh, this is other, also some more great footage of him covering. Well, this year 93. Yeah. Um, just talking about how unique these dynamics are for these storms. And there's so many YouTube videos you can go online to sort of get an idea exactly. Um, uh, just all the great work that he's done over the past several years. Isn't that great? <laughs> you, you got so And then this was in December of 2000. Are you sure it's turned on on the computer? That's what I'm wondering. Like, how many viewers did you end up getting on social media for April 27th? Like, on Ustream? Like, oh, yeah, a lot. We served over 70,000 concurrent live streams we had uh, just on Ustream. Yeah, so, I mean, he went nonstop coverage. It was, it, was a, it was a non jam packed day of just horrible weather that day. And this is the Coleman tornado. It was just the first tornado that they showed live, I think. There was only one storm in the state, and he saw it, and they interrupted programming. He just said, we need to monitor it. And before you know it, before your eyes, they could see for miles and be able to see this amazing tornado that was captured in Coleman, Alabama. And then in the next video, as you're going to tell, um, we also, he also did some uh, amazing coverage from the Tuscaloosa tornado showing the EF4 coming straight towards uh, near downtown Tuscaloosa, as you'll see shortly. But his work has been extensive for many, many decades, and there's still <coughs> plenty of time. And um, just it's just amazing of the work that he's been able to do over the past decades, and it's just an inspiration, especially for me, and I'm sure for many people out there as well. Um, I would run it off of this if you got this. Yeah. So, but just to give you an idea, he's he's gone through a lot, he's experienced a lot, and with that further ado, I'm going to pass on everything else to you, James. Cool. I'll let you get my computer back up. That's the program. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. Uh, no, I, uh, I've been on television a long time, and, and uh, I tend to say a lot of things, and I'm not going to talk long tonight. I don't like long, boring speeches. The core of what I want to talk about tonight is things we learned after April 27th. Uh, I did want to mention one of our snow events we had back in January of this year. Uh, the uh, television station snapped a new uh, publicity photo after the uh, January snow, and I thought I was looking pretty good. Uh, I looked like this. Now, mine's not going to work. This is great. Uh, I look just like, just like that. <laughs> we had a horrible forecast. Um, the, the one thing that we have to learn in this business, it is, uh, it's humility. We had a horrible situation back in uh, January, and let me just start by mentioning this. I wrote an apology, and some in the weather enterprise didn't like this. There were some people that thought this was inappropriate. Uh, we wound up with a snow event that was a humanitarian crisis. It was a civil emergency, and uh, it was not forecast well. It was forecast very poorly, and 
I wrote this, and I, I disagree with those that say that uh, an apology was not appropriate. I've been in this market for a long time. I, I've been in Birmingham since the late 70s. I spent some time away in Dallas in the 80s, but for the most part, I've been there. And I'm the guy that's been there the longest. And, and this was a situation where we said there was going to be a dusting of snow, no travel problems. And you had some people that were stranded out there for over 20 hours. And I just say that this is the one thing that is missing in our science. I, I do believe it is an appropriate thing for a scientist to say, I was wrong. I think it's appropriate for a scientist to say sometimes, I don't know. I don't know why we can't say that. It's like sometimes I feel like this, this science attracts people that are narcissistic or something. It will bring you to your knees. There's a lot of things we don't know and there's a lot of things we can't do. But just to give you a quick dose of this uh, snow event, uh, this was what it looked like on the air. And we said basically this would be a, a light snow, a dusting. And what's the mistake I made? The, the population centers in my state are Tuscaloosa, Birmingham, Anniston, Gadsden. Years ago, somebody told me this, and I think it's a good thing. Anytime you've got this line within 40 miles of these population centers, this is one million people, you always pull that line up to here to include those larger cities. Uh, the two, and, and you know, in places like Buffalo or, or Chicago or Minneapolis, St. Paul, two inches of snow, people would laugh at that. What made this different was the fact that we had uh, two inches of snow when it was 19 degrees. The accretion process is radically different. And I didn't understand this. On my watch, going back to the late 70s, this has never happened. A couple of inches of snow at 19 degrees. Traditionally, in my market, when it snows, it's 30 to 35. And you know, the one thing we have to all be better at is impact forecasting. Impact forecasting should be what we're all about. And the truth is, I don't know anybody that's a road engineer that's in the science of meteorology. I, I, I'm not. And so I spent some time talking with road engineers trying to find out what made this different, what happened. And apparently what happened was the fact that we had this light snow coming down at 19 degrees. Initially there was some melting because of exhaust and tires. And then there was a flash freeze. That never happens where I am. It never happens. So we had a layer of ice and the snow went on top of that and this happened. We had some people for 20 hours out here. And understand, this was a point where people were getting desperate. We had five people that died in an event where we got on television and said a dusting, no travel problems. People were out here that they needed medication, they were running out of fuel, they couldn't charge their cell phones, they were getting cold, they had young children in the car, all the families were separated. Uh, there was a twinge of panic going on here. This was uh, one of the major interstates in, uh, in Birmingham. By the way, this was taken from a drone. These are cool. <laughs> We've got to get one of these. Uh, it's illegal, oddly enough, for television stations to own these. You can own one as an individual, but the FAA bans commercial television stations from owning them, which is very frustrating. Uh, there's a GoPro camera attached to the drone, and they have flown this thing through all of our winter weather events and they provided some remarkable footage but I just wanted to start with that this thing is fresh on my mind um, we've got to get better at impact forecasting but what I want to talk about it's the uh, April 27th event from a few years ago this was three years ago uh, I want to discuss some of the things that happened on that three-day stretch. The total tornado output was 358. That's a record for a continuous outbreak and in my state we had 62 on one day. That was April 27th. And in my state alone on that day the death toll was 252. That's unacceptable for anybody, anybody in <coughs> science that is unacceptable. And for people that think it's acceptable, it's okay, it could have been worse, I say you need to revisit your priorities. It was an excellent warning for every single tornado, and yet a lot of people didn't get the message, or they got the message, they didn't do anything, or they didn't know what to do. And as I said up at the top with this snow stuff, we've got to be better at impact forecasting, and we've got to be better at social science. And here's the problem for everybody in this room. I assume most of you in here are in geography or geology or meteorology, atmospheric science. You're in physical science. None of us are in human behavior. I'm not. I've never taken any class in social science and we're gonna have to learn some social science to be better at what we do 
this is a graphic of all the tornadoes on that day. Uh, the first tornado of the day was up there in uh, uh, the north, uh, hang on, let me back this thing up. First tornado of the day was up in the northwestern part of the state. Uh, the last one was down here in Chilton County. We had three EF5s. Uh, we had two side by side. Two were in uh, northwest Alabama. We had a third up in DeKalb County in the northeast part of the state. We had multiple EF4s. Uh, some of the ones that were the more famous ones that day, this is the Tuscaloosa Birmingham tornado. Uh, this uh, number 37 is the one that hit uh, Coleman. And uh, the, the totals, we had three EF5s and eight EF4s. And this all happened in a 24 hour period on April 27, 2011. I call this generational. Let me share some of the things I'm involved with uh, and talk about what went right, what went wrong, and the things we have learned. And we have learned a lot. I have learned a lot since that day. Uh, my core job, I'm the uh, main weather guy at the ABC channel in Birmingham, market size number 40. We have a 24-hour cable channel branded with my name on it. It's on our D2, our digital, uh, uh, one of our digital channels, uh, the dot twos. It's on cable systems around the state. Uh, I'm on commercial radio. I do weather for the uh, Cox Radio Group. That they've since sold the group to uh, Summit Media, but that's seven stations in Birmingham. And down the road in Tuscaloosa, which is about 50 miles away, I'm on a group of five stations, a company called Town Square Media. And in Gadsden, which is also a larger city in the market, I'm on Clear Channel Radio Group there. There are two stations. So when it comes to traditional radio and television, this is what I've got. And I just want to share with you the, the platforms I had that day of sharing this information and what went right, what went wrong. So that's traditional radio and television. And I should mention on top of that, there are small, other small market radio stations uh, around the state. Commercial radio is still a big deal, by the way. Uh, on, the, on the digital side, um, we have a blog. And, and let me just say this. I've, kind of, I've got a different arrangement. Uh, we have a private weather group, a little business called the Weather Factory. We, we were known as the Weather Company for many years, but we sold that name to the Weather Channel last year. Their parent group now has our old name. Uh, we went and bought a $9 domain name called the Weather Factory, and we're very happy, and they're happy, so we're all good. But we, we uh, uh, I'm not going to tell you how much we sold the, the deal for, but we got the better deal, I'm telling you. Uh, this blog belongs to us. It doesn't belong to the TV station. For, for a local television meteorologist, this is an odd arrangement. But I'm an early adopter. Early adopters have some advantages. And we got all this stuff done way back in the, in the mid to late 90s. Uh, but we own that. It's, it's a very high traffic blog. We have uh, many, many days. We'll go over a million page views. And it's starting to generate some very significant revenue. We don't put up dollar a holler banner ads on there. We sell a limited number of, in, uh, of ad messages uh, at a premium. And of course, my television station has a website, but it's pretty, I don't know. It, it's like most television websites. It's on a CMS platform that I, that's kind of standard, and I don't have a lot to do with that, but yet I can use that if I need to reach people. Um, apps at the time, and again, this was back on April 27th. This was three years ago. There's a news app. There's a weather app. And again, these are apps that are fairly standard. If you go to any, most te you know, any television station, these apps are, are pretty similar. Uh, I think an important thing we do is stream our coverage on Ustream. One of the things I think is that our coverage should be universally available, and uh, that's universally available. So, it, and we did not, we have other apps now, but this is all we had at the time. And those are the mobile apps. Uh, on the social media side, uh, at the time, we used Twitter, the Span account. Uh, on Facebook, my page is facebook.com slash James Span. My regular profile is facebook.com slash Span. And there's a really big difference, and I hope everybody understands the difference in these things, and we'll talk about that. Uh, I use Instagram. Instagram reaches a lot of younger people, uh, 12 to 24-year-olds that do not watch commercial television, that do not have any particular interest in this. Uh, but those were the big four for me. So on a synoptic scale, the event was forecast well. Uh, this was written April 22nd. This is off our blog. And I'll just say this, the most important work I do really and truly, it's done here. On television, I'm there to tell a short story, a very short story. The really deep stuff, it's over here. And by the way, you have to be a good writer. Um, I regret not taking writing classes. I write basically on the level of a third grader, which might be helpful. I don't know. It, you know, uh, it's a common denominator thing. 
I wish I could go back and learn how to write, and I regret not uh, taking any classes in writing in college, because now a large part of what I do, it involves writing. But this was the uh, Friday before the event, April 22nd, and uh, we talked about a you know, significant severe weather event, uh, all modes of severe weather possible, cellular supercell storms Wednesday afternoon. That was the day of the event, Wednesday, April 27th, followed by a squall line. So, you know, the Friday before that day, we, we started raising the flags. And then the day before, we, we hit this thing as hard as we can across uh, all the platforms we have, the platforms we talked about. This was uh, April 25th. This was Monday, uh, the 25th. Uh, the primary threat of tornadoes, Wednesday afternoon. Supercells, when the cap breaks, a few long track tornadoes, strong long track tornadoes. You start that harsh wording a couple of days in advance. Uh, and then on the day before, you throw everything out there that you've got. This was written 8 o'clock the night before. Uh, and, and again, I, I think the, the event on a synoptic scale was forecast well days in advance. People that are in touch with weather, including everybody in this room, you knew. Um, and it started the next morning. By the way, this was the SPC uh, risk convective outlook for that day. You couldn't draw that thing any better if you knew what was going to happen. These men and women that work at SPC are remarkable. They are gifted. Their products and services are right on the money most every time. High risk, bullseye. They nailed it. There's the moderate risk from um, North Mississippi up into the southwest part of Virginia and eastern Kentucky, the standard slight risk from Mobile, Pensacola, New Orleans, up to Buffalo, and uh, upstate New York. So the day happened. It started. And this is interesting. The morning event we really didn't expect. This was 5 a.m., April 27th. We had a, an MCS or a QLCS, if you will, quasi-linear convective system. Back in the old days, they called them squall lines. Somebody somewhere decided they need to be a QLCS. This, this thing was nasty. And you know what? The night before, I really didn't think that was going to happen. We knew the afternoon and the evening would be horrible. But no, nothing, nothing picked up on this. You know, numerical weather prediction. Everybody in here, we all look at these models. And we, we live by them. We die by them. Sometimes they just don't work. And even the high gridded, high resolution mesoscale models didn't really handle this that well. Now the short term warnings were good obviously, but 12 hours in advance people didn't know this was going to happen that morning. And this in itself was a total disaster. Uh, in my market, a quarter of a million people had no power and this thing killed five people. That in itself is a disaster. Alabama Power Company, which is part of Southern Company, uh, they said that the damage to their infrastructure as a result of this QLCS that morning was greater than the damage in interior parts of Alabama caused by Hurricanes Katrina and Ivan and Camille, even in 1969. And we missed it. And again, this is a reminder, we've got a lot of work to do. Logic, experience, everything we have, it didn't work. We didn't forecast this 12 hours in advance. And after this happened, the, the QLCS moved on to the east. We had about a four-hour break. And we, we went on television that morning. I guess Jason, my morning guy, went on the air about 3 o'clock. I got in there about 4 o'clock. And we got off the air at 9. And we looked at each other, and we just, uh, it was like somebody had rammed a fist in our gut, and we weren't ready for it. And before we could say a word, all these engineers started pouring in tell us, things that were down. We had serious infrastructure damage to the television station. We had cameras down. We had microwave pads down. We had out outages with our cameras that are critical in these things. And finally, after about five minutes, I said, guys, just stop. How about let's change the idea. Instead of telling me things that are not working, how about telling me the things that are working because we've got to go through a horrific day and I've got to know what's working. But these guys spent uh, four hours working very hard to get things back online. One of the cameras that was down was up here in this town called Coleman. This is between Birmingham and Huntsville. They got that sucker back online, and that's a good thing because the first tornado of the day happened to be on that camera that was down earlier that day. Um, years ago, I want to say it was Al Mohler. There were, there were some people that really influenced me heavily as I was a young man in this science. Al Mohler, Chuck Doswell. 
These guys are brilliant. But one of those guys, I want to say it was Moeller, said, the first storm of an outbreak will talk to you. It will tell you a story. And this storm was talking to us. This was the first torn, uh, uh, thunderstorm of the afternoon. The only one in progress at the time, and it dropped this. And this stayed live on camera for, for a while. And by the way, we've got to do a better job of getting these things on camera. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, but this was a good story. It was an EF4. Coleman has about 25,000 people that live there. After this came through town, we called the hospital, and they said nobody had died. It was people with cuts and scrapes, but they'll be fine. And this was a case where the system worked, and we're thinking maybe we can get through this. People heard the warning. They knew how to get the warning. They turned on the television. We had it on camera. They didn't have to seek confirmation by going out in the front yard or looking out the window. They immediately went to a safe place, and everybody was fine, despite the fact that the damage was horrible there. And later in the day, it just got worse. This, uh, uh, and by the way, let me say this. I, I'm going to give some advice as I go and things I've learned. For everybody in this business, whether you work for the National Weather Service, whether you work in broadcast meteorology, whether you're a consultant, let me recommend you use multiple radar sources. I made a horrible mistake on the air that day. And I'm, I'm almost willing to bet you that it killed somebody. In fact, I think it did. There, there was a book, uh, and let me just show you the deal here. Uh, this is uh, the Tuscaloosa tornado, and let me stop it. I'm going to kill it right there. The pixels on that radar display were displaced five miles. The display on television had the pixels five miles to the south compared to where it actually was. So this debris ball was not actually here. It was actually up here. And that error in the radar display caused me to make a bad call on the air. If you go back on YouTube and watch this, I said at one point during this, the tornado looks like it's going to go down Skyland Boulevard, which is this southern part. And it didn't. It went farther north. It went five miles to the north. And I read a book. that There was a University of Alabama football player by the name of Carson Tinker. He was the long snapper. Carson Tinker and his girlfriend were lofted by this thing. The girl died. Her name was Ashley Harrison. And in that book, it talked about some guy on TV talking about it going down Skyline. I could be the guy that killed her. And shame on me for not having two stinking sources of radar and trusting one source. And I, I don't want to get into the vendor. And this was a systemic problem. Everybody that had this equipment had the same problem. And that's a whole lot of television stations. At first, that vendor told me it was no big deal. I almost jumped through the phone. This probably killed people. And you say, it's no big deal. What's the matter with you? But in their defense, they came back and, and they corrected this and they admitted their fault and they've made it right. But I should have had another radar source. You've got to have two. Don't you dare trust one radar source. I will think about this every day until the day I die. But I'll go back and uh, roll the rest of this. Uh, you, you've got the, uh, in fact, uh, let me show the actual video, which is on this next frame. This is the video coming from the courthouse, and we had cameras on this, and, and you know, thanks to the cameras, we could, at this point, I realized it's not going to go down Skyland. It was going farther north, but that's an EF4 tornado that killed 53 people. These were precious people that died. And let me encourage everybody in here to think about what you're doing. It's critical. The people that died here, these were moms and dads and little boys, little girls, college students, your age, high income, low income. It doesn't matter, and it affected all socioeconomic groups. Our guys in the ground, this is from John Brown and Mike Wilhelm. They're not in it for fame or glory or YouTube money. Uh, John and Mike, they've been uh, trained for years and they were safe. The tornado was moving away from them. But you know, the, the other thing too, you know, there, was, there were other tornadoes at the same time, just as bad as that. There is no manual on how to do this right, none. You don't know how hard this is until you stand on that green wall when you've got this stuff going on. It was absolute hell. And again, I'll think, I will think about this day every day until the day I die, what I did right and what I did wrong. But let's talk about lessons learned. You learn one, you've got to have multiple radar sources. 
Here's one thing, and by, by the way, all of this information is based on social science studies. I am so thankful for people like Dr. Laura Myers, a social scientist that has stepped up, that has helped us. They, they've done extensive, detailed research. And I went through all phases after this thing. I went through grief. I, went, I was very down. I'm a very positive guy with high energy, but I was really down for a few days. And, and I, I went through this anger phase. And finally, I got to the point where I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and get to work to fix it. The rest of my career, I got about 10 more years. The rest of my career is going to be focused on getting the warning process better. We've got a long way to go and not a lot of time to get there. But we've learned this for people that work in television. People respond better to live video of a tornado as opposed to radar. You think everybody should know that. Well, I watch television coverage today, and obviously we're not understanding this. You watch long-form TV coverage in most markets today, all you see is stinking radar the whole time, maybe one little sky camera from time to time. This image is pure violence. And I would assume everybody in this room, if you are into atmospheric science, you understand that is absolute pure violence. You understand that. This was the tornado as it was exiting Tuscaloosa County coming up into Jefferson. This is where Birmingham's located. That's your debris ball, and that's your couplet. By the way, this was before we had dual pole. So I don't have the correlation coefficient product to show, a TDS, but I would assure you if we had dual pole, you'd see a TDS with CC, and you'd see it in the ZDR too. But I show that to people on the screen, and you know what they see? They see a bucket of spill paint. <laughs> Well, that's a big, a bunch of pig slop. So, and we can get up there and we can, you know, we, we can clearly communicate. This is violent. You've got to do something now. This is an urgent, life-threatening situation, but they're still seeing a bucket of spill paint. As broadcasters, we have to do a better job of getting these cameras out in the field. I think these guys never got enough credit. This is the Tuscaloosa tornado 40 minutes before it got into town couple of guys with a camera on their dash of the car, uh, speeding it back on the internet. That was live on television. What that did, and I tell you right now, there are people walking around alive today in Tuscaloosa, Alabama because of these two guys. Uh, the guys, one was John Olshu. John is a meteorologist. John is a professional. He worked with me. Uh, John started an internet business and uh, did very well, and he doesn't have to work weekends anymore. So. <laughs> John is doing fine, but whenever there's bad weather, he comes back and he helps. They, they, he was not paid a dime for this, and he was with a guy named Ben Greer. And what that did, that enabled us to call a tornado emergency. That's the most urgent message you'll ever hear. The Weather Service called a tornado emergency. We called a tornado emergency for the cities of Tuscaloosa and Northport. This is an urgent, life-threatening situation. That is a large, violent tornado a wedge tornado that's going to be in Tuscaloosa in about 30 minutes. You better do something now. Get off the road now. If you have students or friends there, you text them now. This was a very urgent deal, and we've got to do a better job of that. Can we get this on camera every time? No, but by golly, I'm going to try. With volunteers like these guys, a bunch of them out there with cameras, more sky cams, we've got to do a better job of that. And what's discouraging is I watch television meteorologists today in many markets when they go wall to wall with tornado coverage, all they show is that stinking bucket of spill paint, thinking everybody's going to go, ooh, look at the, they, they don't see the same things you do even if you communicate it clearly. And I know sometimes that's all we have, I know that. But we've got to do a better job of getting that live on television. And I can prove that with the verbatims from the research from that day. Um, so here's the next one. In my market, there's four stations that do local weather. How many you got in Atlanta? Four? Five? What happens if you turn on one channel and this guy says, uh, there's a tornado warning, you need to go to a safe place, a small room on the lowest floor near the center away from windows. Get into your safe place now. You turn on the next channel and he says, you need to leave your house and go. And you turn on the next channel and he says, the only way you're going to survive is to be underground. What is that sending? What kind of message is that? We have got to, as a weather enterprise, get on the same page. And understand, this is not a criticism of anybody here, OK? Um, after the El Reno, Oklahoma tornado, we had Mike Morgan on weather brains. So this is the first time he's talked about the situation. And you know, Mike told people to drive south. Remember that? 
Do I think it was right? No. Am I going to criticize him? No. I was not there. You don't know how hard it is standing on that green wall when this stuff is happening. I've said some boneheaded things over the years. And I disagree with what Mike said, but I'm not going to criticize him. I was not there. I'm not in that market. I do not understand the culture. I do not understand the people. I do not understand the geography. It's not my call, and it's not yours. But I do know, after these studies, we've got to get on the same page. So we have to put our competitive stuff aside, and we have to get together as a weather enterprise. The, the one important thing that's taking place now in the weather enterprise, these integrated warning team meetings. This brings together broadcast meteorologists, meteorologists with the National Weather Service, and emergency managers, the, the players in the weather enterprise, so we can talk about this stuff. Now, no, you, you watch different channels and people have different personalities. You might not like watching me, you like watching the other guy, that's fine, but we have to have the same general message when it comes to a call to action. It is my opinion, after years of talking with people like Tim Marshall, Tim Marshall is an engineer meteorologist, a guy after my own heart. And I think Tim is the best tornado survey guy in the world. He's excellent. You ought to have him as a speaker sometime. He'll tell you, uh, hey, small room, lowest floor, near the center away from windows. You don't need to be telling them you have to be underground to survive, and you certainly don't need to tell them to leave. In my opinion, a car is a death trap. Put people on the roads, that's not good. But we've got to talk about this. We've got to get together. We have to communicate as a weather enterprise, and I think we can do that. Uh, this can, involves the television side. And boy, I, I've got a real problem with this. Why do we discriminate against people that live in rural areas? And again, I'm not criticizing anybody specifically here. I'm not criticizing any certain market. But I will tell you right now, you've got a tornado on the ground in a large market, hey, you'll get, you'll get live, long-form coverage, live, breaking, whatever they call it. You know, I, I'm not a journalist guy. The minute it gets out of those big city counties and off into the rural DMA counties, they go back to Dancing with the Stars, Freak of the Week, whatever's on television. And they're being discriminated against. Why? Just because somebody lives in a county where there's not that great of a population density and there's only two or three meters from the ratings company, does they make their life any less precious? I challenge everybody in this room, if you want to do what I do, if you want to do broadcast meteorology, you go in there and tell the people up in the front office, if you've got a tornado, you're staying with it. It's ridiculous. I've seen this over and over and over. We're a bunch of weenies because we're afraid somebody's going to call up because we cut off some stinking program on television. Who cares? I mean, there's about a million channels. If you want to watch something, go watch something else. I, this is a big problem with me, and maybe it's because I came from a rural part of Alabama. I'm the Forrest Gump. Y'all ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, that old movie? <laughs> I am from Greenbow, Alabama. I really am. I know the guy that wrote that book. His name is Winston Groom. I serve on a board with him. I said, one day, Winston, is, did you pattern Greenbow after Greenville? And he said, yeah. I'm from Greenbow, Alabama. <laughs> That's a rural part of the world. We went to uh, San Francisco a couple of summers ago. We went to a restaurant called the Bubba Gump Shrimp Company. Y'all ever been to one of those? We went in there and they found out that I was from Greenbow, Alabama. You would think the President of the United States had just walked in there. They wanted me to get over the speaker and talk some Alabama for their customers. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> okay. Jeez. Uh, I'm telling you, I'll stop. I don't get in trouble. I'll stop there. We've got to fix this. We've got to fix this. Every life is precious. I don't care where you live or how many meters or in your county. All right, this one involves, uh, in television, this is a big one to me. Uh, I see a lot of people in my business making mistakes. This seems to be the trendy thing to do now. When there's a tornado outbreak, you, you get off camera and you go over there where that equipment is and you telestrate. You get your little doodad and, and you draw circles and you do things, and that's okay, but We've learned through social science studies that you have to make eye contact to be effective during severe weather. Get on the wall. And again, I, will, I, I love to watch severe. Why do I watch severe weather in other markets? Well, number one, I'm a weather weenie. Come on, if you're a real weather weenie, 
and there's a tornado warning in Omaha, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the Omaha television stations and stream their coverage. And nothing on the national guys, but I've said this before, you can't cover severe weather unless you really understand the culture of that market. You can't. You can try, but you can't do that. I go to local stations, and I'll watch. I watch. And the other thing I'm trying to do, I'm trying to learn good things. I'm trying to look for best practices. I'm looking for techniques that will make me better. And I learn a lot by watching good people. I'm not that good. I work harder than anybody else. I'm not that good, but I learn from watching other good people. And this is getting to be a problem because I see more and more people, men and women, that are broadcast meteorologists, you never see them. The ones that really drive me crazy, the ones that they just show radar for three hours. No human being, just radar. No cameras, no sky cam, no nothing. They got a problem because they're not showing the live stream of the tornado and they're not making eye contact. We have learned through social science studies that your body language and your eye contact, it is crucial in being effective. And I know it's a pain, trust me. I, I don't want to be on camera. I, I'm not a T. I am the most anti-TV guy of anybody in this room. I don't look like one. I don't act like one. I, I, I'm not a TV guy. I'm a physical science guy. But I know based on these studies, I have to look you in the eyes, and you have to look at my body language and read my eye contact to really determine if I'm serious or not. And not all tornado warnings are the same. You, you know that. Some are marginal. You know, some, your life is in immediate danger. And I step up in that lens and I look you straight in the eyes, you know that's some serious stuff. So I encourage you to get on a wall. Let's talk about social media for just a minute. The, the, the talk is, is communicating across all platforms. Um, and let me just say this. Uh, we, we've had a lot of talk about this today. I am in a dying business model. I don't, I don't know if anybody in here wants to go into broadcast meteorology. I, I hate to sound negative, but it's a dying business model. Isn't that great? <laughs> Woo! Uh, we're like the newspapers. In my market, uh, the, the big daily, the Birmingham News, I, I tried to tell this to those guys 10 years ago, and they said, this is a newspaper. It's going to be a tradition here forever. This will never go away. How many times do you think they're printing a week now? Three. Three. And I would assume they'll be down to one pretty soon. Th this whole thing... It, it, what we do, we will always be needed, but we have to build a better model, a new model. People don't consume media with these Ron Burgundy newscasts anymore. Good evening, here's the... This is something from the 70s. I lived through that era, and here we are in 2014 doing the same thing. We have an aging group that still watches that. We can still monetize that, but we better figure this out and do something new. So we don't reach a lot of people through television. We reach a lot of people over here. And I'm just going to share what I do. I'm not saying this is right. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm just sharing what I do based on my experiences, okay? You're a, you're a meteorologist. It's your job to get out severe weather, disseminate severe weather warnings to as many people as you can, all right? Um, I automate warnings to Facebook through an MWIN system. And we have a Twitter account called eWarn that uh, basically is all the warnings for all 67 Alabama counties. Those are automated. The, the software is called Weather Message that's used with the MWIN receiver. But over on the other side, I, I type it in manually. Uh, a lot of people choose to automate uh, warnings on Twitter. I don't. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I just think it's the best use for me on Twitter and Google+. If you see warnings here, they're typed manually. Um, my Twitter account is, is important to me. People used to mock me over in that newsroom. They, 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 they would laugh, and they would point while they were laughing, making fun of me being on the tweeter. This was like, you know, what, seven years ago when it was new. They thought it was, a, they thought it was high school girls gossiping or people saying, I ate a pickle, you know? <laughs> and you've got to admit, when you first got into Twitter, it was kind of weird, wasn't it? I mean, what's, what do you do here? 140 characters, I ate a pickle. There, there. Uh, <laughs> What's funny now, all those people that used to mock me, now they're rolling over, doing everything they can to play catch up with me. I reach a lot of people here, and the one thing I am very protective of this account, if, you, if anybody follows me over there, not one tweet, not one retweet has ever been sent by anybody else but me. Nobody knows my Twitter password but me. A lot of people think that there's like a staff of eight people that work on this thing. I got a bunch of high school schmucks, you know, that are, no, it doesn't work that. I would be scamming you. 
If you're following spam and you have some 18-year-old kids, that's no, that's that's horribly wrong. It's deceptive. Uh, I'm very protective of that. And everything on, on the Twitter account and on Google Plus, I type manually. Google Plus, it's out of. I have to. There's no API for that. Um, and let me just say this: Facebook is a rotten platform for severe weather dissemination. And we've got to communicate that not in this room, but in the masses out there, because a lot of people use social media, they use Facebook, their news feed, that is the way they consume news. That is their newspaper, that is their newscast, that is their weathercast, that is their way of getting severe weather information. And if that's their way of getting severe weather information, it's dead dangerous, all right? Um, so here's the deal. Um, and by the way, I know this is not true. I know. 151,929 people do not like me. I know that. <laughs> you think that's true? You go over to my little folder called hate mail. <laughs> After January 28th of this year, I know they don't like me. Whoo, golly. Haters are going to hate, man. <laughs> Nasty. Uh, why, why do you think people like this? They don't like me. They want to get severe weather information in their news feed. So what's the problem? Hey, it's great. And, and let me say this, you know, what's the fastest growing demographic in social media? Females, 49 to 64. That's a core audience for television, and we need to reach those people. And by the way, let me just say this. If you want to communicate through the media, you've got to be good at communicating people that don't look like you, that don't live where you live, that maybe are of a different political worldview, and uh, a different culture. Yeah, you're good at communicating with people who look like you because you hang out with those people, but can you communicate with a 72-year-old African-American widow? Can you communicate with a 39-year-old housewife with four kids? Can you communicate with a 57-year-old man that's cranky? Uh, <laughs> you gotta be good at that, okay? This is not about you. This is about the people that you serve. A lot of people get in this business it's, you know, thinking you're going to be some puffed up, big time, you're going to get your teeth white, you're going to get some nice hair, and you're going to be some slick TV star. This is not about you. Those days ended years ago. Not that it ever existed. It's about the people you serve. But anyway, what's the deal with Facebook? Uh, well, this is from uh, Facebook marketing, okay? Now, this is older, and I honestly think that percentage is lower now. Pages reach what percent of fans? What does that say? 16. Are you kidding me? So I put out a tornado warning on Facebook to all those like people, 151,000, whatever, and I'm only reaching 16%. Boy, is that dangerous. That is inherently dangerous. They think they're going to get all these tornado warnings, and they're not. Why does, why does Facebook do this? They have an algorithm called EdgeRank that determines what you see in your newsfeed. And the main reason for this, of course, is why? They're now a publicly traded company. They have to show rapid financial growth. And part of that rapid financial growth is you paying them to promote your posts. I could pay them $100,000 a day and still reach less than half my people. Uh -uh, it's just not working. So it is my job to tell the public, don't you dare rely on Facebook as a way of getting severe weather information. Now, look. You can use it, and you, you'll get some of my stuff about standard weather. Hey, it's going to be sunny and 65 tomorrow. But if you miss that, that's okay. But if you miss there's a tornado 14 miles southwest of you that's about to come to your neighborhood, you've got a problem here. So we've got to tell people this, is, this ain't it. This is not it. Um, I love Google+. Plus. Um, oh, by the way, let me say, this is the uh, profile. I've tried to move everybody over to the profile page. It's like 135,000 here. I've almost got them all over here. This is my regular profile. Why do I do this? Well, I can reach more. I can't really prove that. I don't have the empirical evidence to show you that, but I can tell by the feedback I'm reaching more people here than on that like page. On the like page, yes, I monitor that. People can post things. It's wide open. But when it comes to uh, the severe weather stuff, I put it on the profile. And, and you're limited to 5,000 friends, but you can have an unlimited number of followers. And I'm just telling you, you're going to reach a lot more people here. You don't get the good metrics like you do on those like pages, but it just works better for me. So that's my approach. I do all the severe weather stuff on my profile and those that follow. Uh, Twitter and Google Plus, they don't filter this stuff out. Uh, uh, 
Uh, that's Twitter, and it is a marvelous platform if you're not on this. I call it fake. We're streaming live. Hello. <laughs> okay. I, I call it Facebook without the stupid. Um, my, my greatest struggle, it's dealing with the stupid questions when I'm tired on Facebook. Like, I will pour out my heart and my soul. You know, no severe weather, no problems, uh, just a little light rain tonight and, and blah, blah, blah. And then this might blah, blah, blah comes in there. Are we going to have any severe weather tonight? Well, I just said that. I mean, it's just like, what? Um... But they're, they're my customers. They came to me and asked me that. It's my job to answer that in, a, in an appropriate way. That's my fault for getting shaky with that. But th this is a marvelous platform. Same thing here. People say, well, there's crickets over on Google+. Plus. There's nobody over there. Well, they said the same thing about Twitter seven years ago. They said the same thing about Facebook and MySpace and all these things. I'm an early adopter. Uh, hey, I got the word weather on Google+, Plus before the Weather Channel. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, and th th this is Google. This is not some, you know, kid in his basement that got a little bit of VC money here, okay? So let me encourage you guys to, to be early adopters. I got to hurry. I'll be out of here in, t I got 10 minutes? Okay. Um, for those in television or broadcasting, the live stream is just as important as your transmitter and antenna. We have, we old, old people have the mindset of being sure and engineers at the transmitter, you got the generator running. Well, uh, again, as I said earlier, we, we uh, streamed 70,000 concurrent live streams on Ustream during April 27. And uh, people were in their safe place watching the coverage on their phones. And that's critical. That's crucial. And again, if you're in television or you get into television, and, and I think this is not a big problem like it used to be. There's still some TV stations that stream proprietary, like Flash or Windows Media Player, please. It's got to be universal. It doesn't matter what kind of phone you have, what kind of doodad you have. They've got to be able to see it. None of this proprietary stuff. And they've got to be of this mindset. Your live stream is just as important as your transmitter and antenna. And I'll say this is important during these regular newscasts we do. Watch our live stream on our 11 o'clock news some night, and you'll see. We have a lot of fun on that deal. Uh, <laughs> commercial radio. Uh, this might be kind of old school, but let me tell you what, it's really not. Uh, I believe that we should simulcast our audio on local radio stations. Uh, radio might be old school, but by golly, it works. It works good. Doesn't depend on internet connectivity, doesn't depend on bandwidth limitations. It works great. And if you watch all those YouTube videos, uh, uh, James Spann, April 27th, you hear the car radios going, you hear me talking in there, that, they're listening to commercial radio stations. Uh, I'll stop there, but that, that's a big deal. Um, the audience. We did a really poor job of reaching low-income and Hispanic families, and shame on me. I should have known this before that day. Yeah, it's easy to reach everybody in, in your little neighborhood. You, you know, we're, 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 most of us around here, we're okay. We're not low-income. You're going to school, and you might think you're low-income. You don't know low-income. I'll take you to some parts of Georgia, and I'll show you low-income. Same thing in Alabama. There is abject poverty in these two states that we live in. And I mean, it's serious. I'm not so sure we have the right to walk past those people in need. And shame on me for doing this for all these years. Uh, we did a very poor job of reaching low-income families and Hispanic families. Did I lift one stinking finger to reach Hispanic families? No. And some of the Hispanics died on April 27th because they couldn't understand what we were saying. And forget if there's legal, Ill, I don't care about that stuff. This is human life we're talking about. I don't care. That's a different argument for a different day. We're talking about protecting life and property. So we're working with getting some Hispanic radio stations to partner with us. That, that, that has a very effective reach in the larger cities like Birmingham and Atlanta. And we're working with local municipalities to get weather radios in the hands of those that can't afford it. You, you think... Everybody in the world can afford a $30 weather radio. You're dead wrong. And we've made some pretty good progress. And, and this is front of mind for me. And it goes back to the thing of being successful. You've got to reach people that don't look like you. Uh, accuracy is a big deal. Goodness. Uh, what do you think the FAR was in Birmingham, Alabama? And, and let me just say this up front. I don't issue warnings. Who issues the warnings? The National Weather Service. Uh, and I'm not being critical of the National Weather Service. They're doing their job. Their job, they're mandated to issue a warning for every single tornado. I say we're not that good. I know we're not that good. 
um, false alarm ratio in Birmingham was about 80%. 80% of the tornado warnings were false. Warning, nothing happens. Warning, nothing happens. Verbatims, over and over and over in social media research. I hear those tornado warnings all the time, and what? Nothing ever happens. So April 27th, we have this life-threatening situation. Tornado warning, hey, it's those same buffoons. Nothing ever happens. Let's keep the party going. Um, it was too high. But uh, let me say this. The Weather Service in Birmingham went back to basic science. Those guys are heroes. They went back to basic science. Science and operations officer, the Sioux there is Kevin Laws. Little things. How many tornadoes do you think have touched down in Alabama with an LCL height above 1,000 meters since 1950? Zero. Not one. So why are we issuing tornado warnings with an LCL height of over 1,000 meters? <coughs> Little things like that. And I'm proud to say those guys have cut that FAR, the false alarm ratio, from 80% to 40%. They've cut the thing in half. That's remarkable. I'm not so sure it's going to be any better than that. We're going to try. Uh, there was a storm, an isolated storm Sunday. They could have pulled the trigger on a tornado warning. There was a couplet. And there was a wall cloud, and everybody was kind of freaking out, but the LCL height was 1,200 meters. These guys have just done a fantastic job in responding to the challenge. A couple of other things, we'll do some questions. Um, I could really get cranky on this one. <laughs> uh, why, do we, why do we live in a siren mentality? Every time there's a tornado, the, the news media come in, uh, you know, residents said they never heard the sirens. Well, so what? They're not if they're inside a building. You're going to hear a siren in here? This is World War I technology, and we're in 2014, and the world thinks that's how you're going to get a tornado warning. That's nuts. Here's what happened that set me off on this. It wasn't April 27, 2011. It was January 23, 2012. I will close my eyes. I will see Christina's face. Here's the deal. Tornado, 4 o'clock in the morning. Birmingham, January 23rd, 2012. The warning was up about 30 minutes before this thing got here. What, what, what did the grieving father say? The family didn't hear the what? Warning siren. They had the siren mentality thinking they were going to hear some magical siren at 4 o'clock in the morning to wake them up to go to a safe place. If you think you're going to hear one, you have no hope. And their 16-year-old daughter, who's a brilliant student at a local high school, died. Uh, I have a 16-year-old son, and the head of the Na National Weather Service in Birmingham has a 16-year-old daughter. A lot of you in here won't understand until you are in our position. This ended the siren thing for us. We're done with it. Now, let me just say this. I said something, and I want to apologize, and I should not have I, I, it was wrong. At a talk, I said, in my opinion, all the sirens in the, in the United States ought to be taken down and burned after this. That's wrong, because sirens do reach a limited number of people outdoors. It is a last resort. If it reaches five people, let's leave them up. But we've got to do a better job of teaching people you should never rely on these things. And I guarantee you, you go out here in Alabama and Georgia, you comb these neighborhoods out here, and most everybody thinks, well, I'm going to hear a siren. I'm always fine. Or they'll call you. I'd like to know who I talk to to get another siren in my neighborhood. It used to be, I, I would be nice, and I'd say, well, you called your local emergency management agency. Now I say three words, are you crazy? <laughs> Go buy a stinking weather radio. Um, this changed everything. And by the way, you will have in your career really one or two days that define who you are. You never know when those days are coming. You, be, you better be ready for them. Uh, April 27th was one of mine. I probably had about three in my life. I'll do one more thing and we'll stop and do some questions. Uh, I think we have to do a better job of educating journalists and meteorology. Anybody a journalist per person in here? We have our journalist. You're the only one. Do you feel lonely? No. No. Oh, we have. We have you know, I, it's easy for us to be critical. I would never be able to be a journalist. I don't see how you do what you do. They've got to be experts on everything. A plane goes missing, a Boeing 777, Malaysia Airlines. All of a sudden, you've got to be an aviation expert. Helicopter crashes, Como in Seattle. You've got to be a helicopter expert. You've got a judicial trial. You've got to be a, a legal expert. You, you, 
You, you got to be a government, a civics expert. I, I would never, weather is easy. I just got to do one thing. I am blessed. All I got to do is focus on my little science and I am good. Journalists have a hard job. And I'll give you an example. Uh, th the day Christina Heichelbeck died, um, I walked in my little room. I, I work in a room about the size of a closet. <laughs> You ever watch Weather Brains? You've seen my closet before. And uh, I don't know why, you know, she said something that just, just didn't work for me. She's, I walked in the room and she said, rare, Alabama's, rare tornadoes strike Alabama with no warning. After I, let me tell you something, I'm old and tired. And I, I've been up all night. I, I didn't have a chance to take a nap. And I was really, really tired. And, for some reason, I just thought that she was, that was a discredit to everybody in the weather enterprise. Private sector meteorologists, uh, the government meteorologists, the weather service, emergency managers. And I, I did, you ever, you ever just put out a tweet you wish you'd take back? <laughs> I know you've never done that. Uh, it wasn't really an ugly one. I just said, Diane, you said on the air that you say there was no warning. I say there was. Let's debate. I'll come on your show or you come on mine. And it got into a Twitter funk. Uh, look, she didn't know anything about tornadoes. Come on, she's, she lives in Manhattan. There are tornadoes in Manhattan. It would be like me going to New York and having to critique an opera. It's just not working for me. I don't understand it. Uh, and I know that that was probably written by some writer. I, I don't know how it worked. I'm not a journalist. I don't understand it. Uh, but it, it got out of hand the next day. It got into this big old Twitter funk. Uh, all, all these memes started popping up. Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, st I started feeling bad, man. Because you know, after you get some sleep, you're thinking, oh, I can't believe I did that. Uh, and what's weird at the time, I looked, I had more Twitter followers than she did back then. I hadn't looked at it since then, and, and the ABC News guy called our manager and asked us to stop it. And they were going to do, they, they were going to do a story that night, and look, look I'm, I'm defending them. They came back and did a very good story. There's a guy here, and I'm trying, Steve, yes, he did a marvelous job. And he called me personally, and he said, look, that just slipped. And I, and I apologized to him. I said, I, I apologize for starting this. Th this is not right. But to their credit, they came back and did a really good story on how effective the warnings were the, the next night. And, and I look back at this, and I, 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 don't, I don't like this. I, I like the things that, that bring us together. This was hardly wrong. Uh, let me warn you all, don't tweet when you're tired. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they, they came back, and they did a really good job. So I, I know I've gone too long here. We've we got to leave. Uh, Here's, here's the thing, guys. Uh, th these are lessons we've learned. But the bottom line is this. To approach your job correctly, if you're in meteorology, whether you want to work for the government, the weather service, you want to work for the private sector, for maybe a broadcast facility, you want to work for an airline in meteorology, whatever you do, I, I think the thing that we have to remember, and I missed this for so long in my career, you have to approach it with a servant's heart. That means putting the needs of those you serve before your own needs. I was a jerk. For many years, I got caught up in this TV culture. I don't know what it is. Anybody ever seen Anchorman? You know? What would what, uh, what, what that guy say, the, the other Anchorman to Ron Burgundy? You know, talking about somebody rubbing Vaseline on your hiney and, you know, somebody's going to tell you it's special and different. Look, people think that when they're in television. That's horribly wrong. We are simply public servants. That's all we are. And I regret, I, I bought into that culture when I was a young adult. And in my older age, I've learned the reason we're here is to serve other people. And if you have that servant's heart approach, then you will be successful in everything that you do. If you want people to, to be attracted to you, you know, I'm special, you know, I, I got some white teeth and I got me some good hair and old pockets. No, nobody cares about that stuff. I mean, it's okay. It's about how you serve the people. And, and in our science, we have a long way to go. We need to approach it with a servant's heart and with humility and the fact that we've got a lot of work to do. There have been too many funerals on my watch, too many. I started doing this in the late 70s. I have no idea how many people have died on my watch, but I will assure you it's probably in the range of 500. And these were precious people. And a lot of that is on my back because I didn't take the time to learn how to do this better. 
And that's all I'm doing from here on out. I, my, my focus is on making the severe weather warning process better. We've got to work with social scientists. We have to admit, we're not behavioral experts. Weather people are weird. I, I mean, we're strange little people, you know? I mean, uh, we have to understand how to better serve everybody and reach these people we're not reaching now. But still, this is the most rewarding thing you can do. And one more thing, and I'll be done. I encourage you guys to approach your job with a passion. You ought to love coming into that office every single day. I am an old man. I cannot wait to go to work every day. Now, this is weird. I work at the TV station from 2 until 11. I work the night shift. I get up in the morning at 4.52 to do radio and Internet work. I cannot wait to walk in the door of the television station. I cannot wait even for that alarm clock to go off at 4.52 because I get to tell people about the weather. It is a privilege. It is something that excites me. It has excited me ever since I was a child. I have a passion for it. You ought to have the same burning passion within you. And if you don't, you need to consider something else. But if you do, this is the greatest career in the world. I go to schools every day, speak to these kids, get them excited about science. It is a marvelous opportunity. So let me just encourage you, that despite all these challenges we have, this is the greatest career in the world if you want to do weather. All right, I'm done. I've gone over. Anybody want to say anything real quick? If you're mad, this is your chance. Uh, Good. Whew. Uh, Taking questions? Sure. <laughs> I've heard there's some, uh, some bit of conflict, uh, different philosophies or points of view between the meteorologists and the climate people. Woo! Climate <laughs> change uh, issue. Okay, no, I'll, I'll address that. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's become politicized. We live in a polarized nation. Is the climate changing? Yes. Is CO2 a greenhouse gas? Yes. Is there some anthropogenic element to climate change? Yes. I'm in the 97%. Where the disagreement is, it, it's between the alarmists and the lukewarmists. I don't know anybody that denies it. Every, every human being on the planet knows the climate's changing. You know, people start saying you're a denier and their veins bulge out in their neck. I, I, what we have to decide is where's the truth in this? Is it over here on the alarmist side, or is it on the loop? I'm a lukewarmer. I've been in operational meteorology for uh, 35 years. I can't find any empirical evidence that there's any increase in extreme weather events. You should have lived through the 1970s. <laughs> and I'm talking globally. I'm not talking in the United States. But I'm just find, trying to find the truth. And I'm not a climatologist. I, I have passed on that issue. Uh, I've said a few things about it, but I'm done with it. My focus is on weather. I I'm a weather guy. So I would prefer to let experts share. There's a guy in this building that's brilliant, Marshall Shepard. And I assume that most of you know Marshall. He is qualified to speak on that subject. Do Marshall and I agree on everything? Not really, but we're pretty close. So Marshall is the guy that should be answering that question, in my opinion. I hate that it's become politicized. You say climate, and you got the left ring and the white right wing wackos that... that the extremists, we have to drown out that noise. What I tell people, please do not get climate information from Rush Limbaugh or Al Sharpton, okay? And a lot of, pe and a lot of people do. Many people in the United States, you know, based on their political leanings, listen to Marshall Shepard. The guy's brilliant. I you guys have an amazing treasure here at this college in Marshall. You should spend some time with him. And he's qualified to speak on that subject. I, I'm focused on weather. Y yes, sir. I, I'd just like to add that in addition to that, Marshall and I will both say that we're meteorologists first and foremost, but we also have climatologists on the faculty. Right. Uh, Tom Moe, Andy Dunstein, uh, Dave Parenti, and, and others that do climate research. And right. so uh, I, I would just say that, that Marshall and I would, would say we know something about climate, but we're actually not the experts. And I will also mention my wife, Pam, who's been an applied climatologist for 25 years. So, right. so anyway, in, in geography, we have both meteorology and climate. Right. But I hate that that's become a dirty word. Uh, on our show, if you ever listen to the show Weather Brains, if somebody says climate, we just blow a buzzer because people have made up their minds. It polarizes people. I want to focus on the things that bring us together, and that's not my role to talk about that. Um, that there, you listen to some that are alarmist. You listen to some that are lukewarmers, like Judy Curry at Georgia Tech. Judy's brilliant. Uh, there's just a lot of things out there, and we're, we're all seeking to find the truth. But thanks for pointing to bring that up. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll be. Yes, sir. What, what would you say about the events in, in Alabama? There's the extraordinary outbreaks. I mean, is that, is that any indication of anything? That's weather. 
We have had events just like that in 1974 and 1932. Every 40 years, we have an event just like that. Um, so I call it generational. The 1932 outbreak, we think, killed over 500. We really don't know because the news accounts were so sketchy. There were no warnings back then. The 1974 super outbreak uh, was horrific. Uh, that was a national tragedy. That affected Alabama to Canada. Uh, and then we had 2011. So about every 40 years we have that. So that's just weather. Climate is a long, long-term thing. Cli that's the, we have to, I, I hate it when everybody comes in, every time it's hot, it's cold, it's, it's climate change. That's just weather. It, climate is a long-term thing. It's long-term. But again, I'm part of the 97%. I'm, I'm in there, okay? Anybody else? Thank you guys for coming. I hate to uh, go back, but I've got to go. Listen, if y'all need anything, if any of you want to get into this science and you're college students, I, I, know, I tell people all the time, I'm not good for much, but I know a lot of people, and I'll be glad to help you. I'm, just hit me up on the Twitter. You know who I am. Uh, but I'm done, so I'll turn the floor back over to my red-shirted friend down here. small gift, we want to give you this little Georgia mug. So oh, thank yeah. You very much. <laughs> Love them dogs. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you all very much. Thank I appreciate you. Thanks for the opportunity to come over and share. Thank you. The party's over. We're done. <laughs> and uh, we're going to take a group picture outside as well. James, I was in Tuscaloosa on April 27th. Oh, really? Yes. What and, were you doing uh, there? I was, I was in Alabama. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And uh, the coverage is great. It helps save a lot of my friends' lives. So. I appreciate you sharing that. I, at one point, we're going to.